we've known for a really, really long time that the weakest chain in the EV ownership experience isn't the vehicles themselves, but rather the charging networks that they rely on for fast charging on long distance trips, and in some cases, everyday driving. Sure, the statistics are pretty clear. The majority of people who currently own an EV have access to dedicated off-street parking and charging. And if you are in that majority, it is unlikely that you'll need to visit a fast charging much during daily driving because the median distance driven by most people around the world on a daily basis is far, far smaller than even the minimum theoretical range of even the most limited of EVs. I mean, even if you own an early Ford Focus EV, a Chevrolet Spark EV, a Mitsubishi Aimev or an aging Nissan Leaf with a very unwell battery pack, the chances are that you'll still be able to get most of your daily driving duties done from a single overnight charge. As we detailed in our Charging Basics video earlier this year, link in the down below, there are a few different standards around the world relating to fast charging an EV, with CHAdeMO the first out of the block many years ago, but now very much unloved and unsupported everywhere except Japan, that is. Meanwhile, CCS Type 1 and Type 2 became the respective fast charging standard for EVs that weren't made by Tesla, and Tesla developed its own fast charging connector for customers in North America and Korea. Just over a year ago, spurred on by campaigning from Aptera, there was a move to make Tesla's supercharger connector the de facto charging standard in North America, even though the US auto industry to that point had placed its bets on CCS Type 1. And spurred on by unreliable CCS Type 1 charging infrastructure across the US and Canada, Ford, GM, Rivian, and eventually the rest of the auto industry pledged that they would ditch CCS Type 1 in favor of what was to become known as NACS, the North American Charging Standard, Tesla, which had started to retrofit certain supercharger sites with magic docks, special smart charging adapters that allowed CCS Type 1 equipped cars to use its network via its mobile app, switched its attention to helping making NACS an official SAE standard, now known as J3400, rather than deploying CCS Type 1 adapters at every site. And instead of the onus being on Tesla making CCS adapters available through Magic Docs, automakers agreed to sell customers, or in the case of some companies, make complementary adapters available that were certified to work on the NAX network. I know, if you're in Europe, this completely is a non-problem because the EU mandated a long time ago that all EV fast charging stations used CCS Type 2, including Tesla's. That's not only meant that everyone can charge everywhere, but it's also given Tesla many years of successful charging custom from non-Tesla customers and has helped cement a more reliable, diverse charging landscape across Europe. But believe it or not, there are some points in this video that I hope will be relevant to you too. So. Please keep watching. It's early days of that adoption with the majority of automakers committed to NACs, but whose vehicles are not yet officially allowed to use the network. Currently, Ford and Rivian customers can use Tesla superchargers, and by the time this video launches, GM customers either will have already been given access or be pretty close to gaining it. But well, there's a few things about the supercharger network that first-time customers of the network might not know, and so today I'm going to go through some of the things that you, as a non-Tesla customer, should and shouldn't do when it comes to supping on Elon's electrons. Or, to put it more bluntly, how not to be a d It's starting. If you're in North America and you're getting access to the Tesla supercharger network for the very first time, you can look forward to getting far more charging choices than ever before. You might find that there are a bunch of charging stations now available in an area not covered by CCS Type 1 fast charging. I know, for example, as a Ford F-150 Lightning owner, that there's now many more choices for charging my truck on the Oregon coast with Tesla supercharger access compared to what was available before. Well, I don't plan on going to Idaho anytime soon because... Well. 
Let, let's not go there. But if I did choose to head east out of state, I'd no longer have to worry about the climb out of the Columbia Gorge southeast towards Boise on Interstate 84. And my road trips to California just got a whole lot less stressful because of the expansion of charging options available to me. I'm guessing that you're just gaining access to options made available by the supercharger network, and that probably means that you're feeling similarly optimistic, even if, like me, you're unlikely to go out of your way to use a Tesla supercharger if the existing charging network options you have work. While EA and some other networks have historically suffered some pretty terrible charging reliability, we reached our first charging station of the morning and I'm afraid we had more Electrify America woes. DC quick charging station was limited to 32 kilowatts. Just, these two are broken, so good luck. <laughs> Electrify America is the problem. I've noticed in recent months that charging station reliability is improving and frankly, my truck really doesn't care where it gets its electrons. If it can charge for less somewhere other than a Tesla supercharger and it works, I will continue to go there, especially if there isn't such a large queue to charge. There are also plenty of folks out there who have very valid reasons to use alternatives to Tesla supercharging, including not wanting to give Tesla or Elon Musk any money, and that's their choice. But enough waxing lyrical. Let's talk about the do's and don'ts. And the first one, the really important one that could save you from looking like a complete buffoon, is checking that your car is actually ready to use a supercharger network. And luckily, all of this can be done long before you go anywhere near a Tesla supercharger. While you can now buy third-party adapters to give you physical knacks to CCS Type 1 capabilities, the connector itself isn't going to be enough to give you access. As several folks have discovered in recent weeks, Tesla's Supercharger Next system uses plug and charge to authorize non-Tesla charging. And if your car isn't among the group of EVs currently being given access, you will not be able to charge. You can plug in and pose, but that's not plug and charge. Even with the Tesla Supercharger app, try to plug in a CCS Type 1 car and use a NAX adapter that hasn't yet been granted permission to use the network, and the electrons will not flow. Next, make sure that your car actually has received the necessary software updates to access superchargers. Ford and Rivian customers were given a software update that was pushed to their vehicles to enable supercharger access. And without that, your car won't use the supercharger network. So do make sure that your vehicle is ready before rocking up and trying to use it. If you've confirmed that the supercharger access update has been pushed to your car and that you have an adapter that's approved for use, you should be good to physically plug in. But it's also worth making sure that you've set up plug and charge on your vehicle as well. For Ford vehicles, you'll need to have a credit card on file and be signed up to the Ford Blue Oval Network before access is available. You will also need to make sure that the plug and charge option is enabled using your Ford Pass smartphone app. This is an absolute pain in the butt to activate on the road when you have a poor cell phone signal. So make sure that your vehicle and your phone both have a strong connection to the internet when you try and enable it. I would love to tell you at this point that vehicles that have yet to be granted access will follow a similarly easy rollout and I'd love to tell you that older cars like my early Chevrolet Bolt EV will be given access to the network with nary a problem. While GM has talked about rolling out plug and charge to those early vehicles and some networks like EVgo already offer a quasi plug and charge like experience for early Bolt EV owners using hardware identification rather than official plug and charge, I can't tell you for sure that all vehicles from a particular brand will be supported. But my gut reaction at the moment is that newer vehicles will gain access first and then maybe later on either someone will figure out a way around the issue or you'll be able to activate remotely using the Tesla app. At the time of filming though, I don't think any of that has been 100% set in stone. What is worth noting, though, is that you really shouldn't just rock up at a Tesla supercharger without first confirming that all of those previous steps I've mentioned are good to go. That's just a waste of your time and a potential block of other people using the site. 
So let's assume your vehicle has everything set up and you're ready to go experience supercharging for the very first time. What's next? What's next is finding a suitable supercharger that is ready to accept your non-Tesla EV into its fold. And this next point is super important. You need to check that the supercharger you want to head to supports non-Tesla supercharging. At the time of filming, Tesla's earlier V2 superchargers do not support non-Tesla access, partly because I understand they use a different set of communications to the newer V3 and younger superchargers. We did a video on the differences between charging protocols last year, and I'm going to link to it in the down below. Therefore, you'll need to find a supercharger that's a V3 or a V4. But even then, not all V3 and V4 superchargers are open to non-Tesla EVs. In areas where the supercharger network is already under intense demand and where there are regularly queues for people needing to charge their Teslas, Tesla may opt at its discretion to not allow non-Tesla EV access. Tesla's smartphone app should list the sites you're free to visit, and if your car has a connected navigation system, it should also now know which supercharger sites it can and can't use. Frankly, the last thing you want is to turn up at a site and realise you can't charge, especially if you're on a long-distance road trip and you really do need those extra electrons. All of that out of the way, let's talk about the actual charging experience. First and foremost, be prepared for a queue, especially if you're visiting a busy supercharger. There's no official queuing system, but if there are a bunch of Teslas parked near to the supercharger and there are no available spaces, the chances are there's a queue you mustn't jump. That said, given that there are many, many sites where Tesla superchargers are adjacent to, or close to non-Tesla fast charging infrastructure, I suspect that what will actually happen is that people will choose whichever site works and doesn't have a queue. You might have heard Tesla owners talking in the past about the whole skip a charger phenomenon where you try and avoid using adjacent charging stations if there are others available. You might think you need to do the same thing with your supercharger experience, but I should note here that that is only a problem for V2 superchargers where there are power sharing between different stalls of the same number and different letters. But luckily, though, since you can't use a V2 supercharger with a non-Tesla and V3 and newer superchargers don't share power in the same way between stalls, this isn't an issue. But what is an issue, most certainly, is consideration to where you park your EV to charge. Tesla places its charger inlets on its vehicles on the rear left side of vehicles, and supercharger cables are notoriously short. That might be perfect for a Tesla-only charging experience, as shorter cables are lighter, have less chance of getting damaged, and are easier to keep cool in hot weather. But for CCS Type 1 vehicles whose charging inlets are not in the same place as a Tesla, it can cause a bunch of headaches. Ford currently puts its charger connections on the driver's A-pillar and Rivian. Charger inlets are placed below the driver's side front lights on the front bumper, which means you're going to have to park in a space adjacent to the supercharger you wish to use. This means, where possible, that you should try and park on the very right side of a bank of superchargers rather than in the middle of the whole row, as doing the latter will block an additional supercharger other than the one you're actually using. And that might upset other people trying to use the site. Newer supercharger sites now have pull-through stations too that might be more compatible with your EV, while some sites may be even accessible if you park on the back side of the charger and pull the cable through the other way. If you're parking in a non-Tesla bay and the cable reaches, you should be good to leave your car and go take care of any of those your man needs your body might have. But if you need to park in a way that blocks more of the supercharger stalls than you're actually using, you really should stick around while charging or make sure at least one person in your vehicle does because it's pretty bad form to block an additional space and then bugger off. I know. I am half British by birth and half Canadian by birth, and 
American by naturalization, and I know it's okay. Americans aren't known for being great at waiting in line, but I really don't have to explain queuing, do I? If the cable will just not reach and the only way is to mount the curb or climb over a bumper block or wheel stop as some people call them, then do so at your own risk. You may find that you'll get some disapproving looks and I am pretty sure that in some locations there is a parking attendant somewhere who is more than willing to write you a ticket for doing it. In fact, I'd bet a large sum of money on it were I unaware of just how terribly rigged those Dabo tables are. It's also worth noting that if you break the parking furniture, you'll have to pay for it. So parking in an adjacent space is preferred unless there's actually a pull through available. As for towing your vehicle, if you're pulling into a charging space of any sort, you should probably disconnect your trailer unless you can park in a way that doesn't restrict the flow of traffic and doesn't restrict access to other charging stalls. I know that it is a pain to disconnect a trailer, especially the heavier ones, but you should plan on doing that if you're going to be visiting a popular, well-frequented charging station in a busy parking lot, regardless of who owns and operates it. As the thumbnail says, don't be a... The other thing that I want to note here is that while Tesla superchargers are really pretty reliable, if your charging session fails for whatever reason, Tesla will charge you a pretty hefty idling fee of one US dollar per minute or equivalent if you're parked and not charging. So unless you want a really big bill, keeping someone nearby your vehicle in case stuff goes wrong is a... A shrewd move that the Grand Nagus would be very proud of. Of course, the actual process of connecting to the charging station should be pretty easy. If you've got plug and charge enabled, it's literally a case of just rocking up and connecting. If you're needing to activate using the app, follow the directions in the app. But general consensus is that you need to connect your NAX adapter to the supercharger first, make sure that anything that needs to click and lock in place has been locked in place, and then, and only then, connect it to the CCS connector in your vehicle, and then start the charging process. And of course, at this point, there's some more basic charging etiquette that I should remind you of before we finish. Make sure you take your trash or your rubbish home with you, don't cut any queues, and don't park for hours at a time. Although, as I've already noted in the case of the superchargers, you will pay a lot of money if you do. Prepare your car for fast charging if you can. Using a preconditioning function will make the charging faster and make it available more quickly after you're done. And for the love of all that is sacred, please do not stick around when your vehicle starts ramping down its charging rate. For most EVs, this normally starts somewhere between 80 and 90% full. And since you're stopping at a Tesla supercharger, there are hopefully many more choices of charging available for you on your trip. So you really shouldn't need to charge beyond 90% before heading off. So there you have it. Be nice, be considerate, and especially if you're driving something the size of a small European country, be mindful that your lump of metal is a guest at a Tesla supercharger site, even if you are a paying customer. Have you tried a supercharger yet? Was it as good as you hoped it would be? Will you continue to use them? Or like me, are you more likely to use the supercharger network as a backup if more affordable charging is available elsewhere? And if you're in a sensible country that uses CCS Type 2 and has done for years, what tips and tricks have you learned from all of your time accessing the supercharger network? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people that help make this channel possible by funding it through Patreon and YouTube covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure we can be 100% independent. 
If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, $10.08 a year. A massive welcome to our newest supporters, Ralph Koenig, Mr. Eldritch, Dwayne Edegar, and Corey Singletray. To join our list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll also find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have an old fashioned PO box you can reach us at. The address is listed below. And of course, if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store link in the down below as well. This month, we are celebrating wrangling EV FUD with a fantastic t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we also think that this one is well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving.